Okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I will give a talk about new CT method of X-ray computed tomography. So uh, there will be uh, uh, some information about quantitative CT, high res resolution CT, phase contrast CT, and also about uh, augmented reality uh, methods in combination with CT. Um, So this is the measurement principle uh, of CONBEAM CT. Uh, this is uh, uh, a quite, quite, quite easy system. We have, we have here an X-ray source, an X-ray tube. We have a matrix detector on the right side. And in the center, there is a rotary stage. And uh, on the rotary stage, there is a specimen placed. And uh, we measure the absorption uh, of, uh, of the specimen. Um, and then the, the, the specimen is uh, turned something like uh, half a degree, then the next absorption picture, the next projection is measured. And from this 720 projections or 1,260 projections, uh, the 3D uh, information is calculated. This is called reconstruction. And we get uh, finally um, a, a 3D data set with voxels. And uh, each voxel has a certain gray value and this gray value mainly corresponds to the absorption. So when we have a metal, uh, the, the gray value is higher, the absorption is higher. When we have uh, plastics, the gray value is intermediate. Uh, we have an intermediate uh, density and intermediate uh, um, X-ray absorption. And when we have uh, uh, air, then we have a low gray value and then a low absorption um, value. Uh, there are different resolutions of CT systems available for the big, CT, big parts. Uh, when you have a, a part of one meter or even 10 meters, uh, you can use uh, some, some systems where you um, really uh, can investigate really big parts uh, up to cars or, or wings of, of, uh, of airplanes. Uh, you can do it on, on big uh, systems, XXL CT systems, or you can do it with Robert CT. Uh, we have uh, a Marco CT system so where we can also investigate parts up to a length of two meters and a diameter up to 60 centimeters. And then we come to uh, higher resolutions, um, resolutions below one micron, resolutions below one micron uh, possible with uh, uh, conventional CT systems, um, with laboratory CT systems. So we can have resolutions in the, in the area of 500, I would say 600 nanometers. Uh, so um, the industrial CT systems are in the range uh, between uh, a, a resolution of something like a little bit below one micron up to 10 millimeters. And the uh, sample size is something like uh, 100 microns up to several meters, 10 meters. Uh, when you want to have higher resolutions, you have to go to synchrotrons. Uh, we have four CT systems in uh, Wells at the University of Applied Sciences in Wells. Uh, we have a dual source uh, CT systems, uh, which will be upgraded in the next um, month. Um, there will be a, a complete new CT system concerning the electronics and the reconstruction software. Um, this will be available at the end of this year. And then we have a higher resolution system, CT system. Then we have a very special uh, Talbulao grating interferometer CT system. And our highest resolution we can get with this nano XCT system. Uh, here we can uh, have voxel size something like 50 nanometers and uh, resolutions, um, yeah, something like 600 nanometers. And the biggest, biggest parts we can uh, investigate and scan with this uh, um, dual source XCT. So sample height up to two meters and the sample diameter 300 millimeter and uh, maybe a little bit uh, um, uh, in the new systems, uh, we, we can have also 600 millimeter uh, parts. And the height, uh, the weight, the weight of the parts can be up to 80 kilograms. So 80 kilograms is a lot. Uh, here we have uh, an overview of the um, of uh, of the in, in influence factors. So you have to uh, keep the influence factors 
in, in a way that uh, the measurement uncertainty is low. So we have uh, the hardware, you have, you have the operator settings, uh, pre-filtering, source current, acceleration voltage, magnification, object orientation, number of views, special resolution, detector exposure time, we have the environment, we have the measurement object, we have the software, and all this gives uh, a measurement uncertainty. Uh, when you do it carefully, you can get a rather low, uh, rather good results. When you do it, don't do it carefully, you might have uh, troubles. Um, there are different applications of industrial CT system. The main applications is non-destructive testing, metrology. These are the two most important applications. Virtual prototyping, uh, when you uh, want to have an, a virtual model, model of a certain part, um, you can do it uh, with CT. And rapid prototyping, reverse engineering is also an important application of CT. But the most important two ones are non-selective testing and uh, metrology, geometrical measurements in 3D. So now I will, I will come now to the um, uh, new developments, new developments um, in industrial CT, quantitative CT, measuring per CT. So there's really a lot going on uh, because you can get really um, quantitative values. Uh, but before you do this, uh, you have to do an accurate and rapid usable and traceable CT measurement. So you have to, to uh, develop a proper, a proper and proven data processing um, pipeline. Uh, the algorithms have to be uh, checked carefully. There have, has to be a good agreement with reference measurements uh, so that you have in overall a good accuracy, a good reversibility, a good traceability. Then you can get physical numbers. Uh, what physical numbers are possible? So metrology, the measurement of hidden structures and, of, and inner geometries is possible. Measurement of wall thickness, thicknesses actual nominal, nominal comparison of the real part and of a CAD model. You can do a poor evaluation of metallic and polymeric foams. You can measure the porosity of metals and polymers uh, in a quantitative way. You can measure the fiber orientation. You can measure diameter, length of fibers, and so on. You can measure, uh, you can characterize and measure quantitative values of the 3D structure of materials, something like interconnectivity, sphericity of uh, granules. You can do a 3D measurement of isolated discontinu discontinuities of cracks, voids, inclusions, demol demolinations, and so on. And a nice example, um, and uh, example which uh, uh, we do very often, is to measure the fiber orientation of uh, glass fiber reinforced polymers or of carbon fiber re reinforced polymers. So in this case, uh, you the blue values is the, uh, uh, is the um, orientation uh, tensor, a, a one value of the orientation tensor is here shown in blue, it's AZZ, and uh, the orientation tensor in XX is shown in red, and the orientation tensor in the Y direction, AYY is shown in green, and you see we have uh, five different layers, we have a surface layer, we have intermediate layer and a central layer, in the center layer, the uh, fibers orientated, mainly orientated in X direction. And on near the surface, uh, the uh, fibers are mainly oriented in Z direction. And uh, this can be compared uh, with uh, standard methods. So the standard method is just to do a, um, a, a 2D evaluation in the optical microscope of the, of the fibers. And you see there's a good correspondence between uh, the 3D measurements done by CT and the 2D measurements done by uh, optical microscopy. Uh, we can evaluate with one measurement something like 75,000 fibers at once uh, in the, with the optical microscope is much more difficult. And this uh, gives the orientation of uh, the fibers. Uh, uh, we have here at the, uh, at the top, a melt line, so the two halves of the melt are coming together, and you see there is a melt line. So the um, uh, fibers are mainly oriented uh, in uh, in the green direction. So this is uh, is the y direction, and on the bottom we have another bar, and here we have no melt line, 
you, you see that the fibers are mainly oriented near the surface, parallel to the surface. And in the center, we have this central uh, orientation. We can measure also the fiber length, the fiber length distribution of glass fiber reinforced polymer. You see that the uh, fiber length distribution function changes with the uh, concentration of glass fibers. When we have 60% glass fibers, we have only short fibers. When we have just 10% uh, glass fiber concentration, uh, we have uh, also longer fibers. So the weighted mean fiber length uh, decreases with the fiber content. So the weighted mean fiber length is something like one micron, sorry, one millimeter, 1000 microns. Uh, when we have 10% fiber concentration and it's just 360 uh, microns, when we have 60% fiber length concentra uh, fiber concentration. We can do also quantitative evaluation um, for for complex uh, materials. Here we have a complex structure. It's a magnesium a magnesium alloy. Uh, so we have here magnesium together with 6% zinc and 1% zirconium and some rare earth metals. This gives uh, a complex and nice 3D structure. We have in the center the magnesium grains and around these grains, uh, we have some interconnected network of intermetallics with zinc and some rare earth metals. You see two different uh, intermetallic phases. One is smooth uh, and one is, has a laminar structure. The laminar structure has also a higher gray value. So this means uh, there are uh, uh, elements um, uh, with a higher uh, electron, with a higher number of electrons in this uh, intermetallic uh, structure alloy. And we can, uh, determine something like the structure separation, the separations between the grains, the structure thickness, the volume fraction, the interconnectivity, the Euler number, and isotropy. Uh, we can also calculate the uh, average dendritic cell size, it's something like between 150 and 200 microns in diameter. So all these uh, physical values can be uh, determined from the CT measurements. And when you do some uh, hot rolling, this is shown here, so it's hot, the material is hot rolled. So here just with uh, something like 10% up to 57% uh, uh, hot rolling. And uh, you see that the anisotropy is um, increasing for different materials uh, with increasing reduction. So with increasing rolling and the interconnectivity, the interconnectivity uh, in the initial state is almost 100% something something like 97% and the inter interconnectivity is decreasing with the reduction. So this means uh, there, uh, the, there is some change in the, the 3D structure of the material. So these were just a few examples, uh, a few examples about uh, quantitative CT. Now we'll come to, uh, to uh, nano CT, to sub-micron CTs. So this is, um, in the field of uh, CT devices with resolutions below one micron. There are several CT systems available on the market with resolutions be one, be, be, below one micron. Uh, here you see a carbon fiber reinforced polymer sample. Uh, we have measured it with a 250 nanometer voxel size. And uh, you see here uh, the, um, the carbon fibers uh, quite nicely. The, the carbon fibers are not really round. Uh, there are some uh, pores uh, inter intermediate here. There's a pore with a diameter of 2.7 microns. And here we have a gap of from 529 um, nanometers. So when you look at the left, left side, here we have uh, the carbon fibers uh, perpendicular to the surface of uh, the screen. And here we have it parallel to the screen. And here then we have uh, regions uh, with no carbon fibers, just, just with some polymer. And uh, we have also here a higher dense particle and the carbon fiber diameter is something between seven and eight microns. So this uh, uh, material can be uh, very nice analyzed by this high resolution CT uh, measurement. In this case, uh, the measurement take, took uh, 12 hours. When you do high resolution measurements, um, uh, this is uh, a usual uh, measurement time. Usually you measure something like half an hour, one hour.
Another example is shown here. Here we have a complex uh, aluminum silicon copper alloy. We measured it with 400 nanometer voxel size. Uh, and we have a fishbone-like fish structure. Uh, and we have different uh, intermetallic alloys in this sample. So here we have the aluminum matrix. Then we have here the, silic the, the copper here. The copper structure gives this fishbone-like structure. And when you, we have also some um, silicon particle here. And when you look very carefully, very, very carefully, you cannot see it nicely at, at the screen. There are also, there's a silicon particle with a length of 43 micrometers. The silicon and aluminum has a very similar um, uh, X-ray uh, attenuation, X-ray absorption. Therefore, the contrast is low, but there is a certain contrast but we can see the uh, copper distribution, uh, the copper reach phase is uh, much better than uh, the difference between aluminum and silicon. Uh, now we'll come to 40 CT or in situ CT. In this case, a process is monitored. Um, so the typical processes are st static or dynamic low tension, compression or torsion, sometimes also determine mechanical behavior of materials, phase transitions, physical reactions like sintering or diffusions, or also chemical reactions. Uh, these um, reactions, these processes can be monitored by a CT. Uh, there are some challenges uh, because uh, you have to uh, find an optimal combination of the in-situ test trick and the CT. The speed, uh, where you, the speed uh, when you have a fast process, you cannot monitor it uh, nicely with a, with a uh, uh, industrial CT because industrial CT is too slow. Then you have to go to the synchrotron. But when you have a, 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 a low speed of the process, uh, you can do it quite nicely. But you have to keep in mind that the experimental feasibility and reliability has to be uh, kept. Here we have uh, three in, test, in, in situ test tricks. Um, so we have a tensile test trick, 5 kN, 500 Newton, and also a temperature test trick. Uh, here we can have temperatures between minus 20 centigrades up to 160 centigrades. And we have a novel test trick. It was uh, developed um, in two projects. And uh, here we have a 500 Newton in situ uh, test trick where we can change the temperature between minus 50 centigrades up to 100 centigrades and this is especially interesting and um, for of course for plastics because we have here some changes. What happens when you use uh, such an in situ test trick? So here you see um, uh, what happens on the right side. Uh, here we have a, in a tensile uh, stage, a tensile uh, sample and um, uh, uh, here we have glass fiber and false polymer and we increase the force. And when the force is too big, uh, the sample breaks because before breaking, uh, some um, damage uh, is introduced. Some matrix cracks are introduced. Some fiber fracture might be introduced. Some fiber pullouts. So the fibers are pulled out of the, pulled out, out of the polymer or some fiber matrix debondings are happening. So this means that the connection between the fibers and the matrix is not so good anymore. And here, here's an example. So with increasing force, uh, here in this case, uh, we have 15% uh, glass fibers um, uh, in, in the polymer. And uh, the dominating uh, damage mechanism is the fiber pullout. Uh, we have also some matrix fractures. We have, all, we have not so much fiber matrix debondings, but we have fiber fracture and fiber pullout. However, this uh, different um, uh, damage mechanisms depend on the materials, on the fibers, on the polymer, on the, uh, and the, on the connection between the fibers and the polymer, and also on the fiber orientation. And this is shown here. Here we have fiber orientation zero degrees. So this means the fibers are parallel oriented to the um, tensile force. Here we have 90 degrees, so the fibers are oriented perpendicular to the force 
And here we have the uh, uh, five orientation, 45 degrees. And they different um, uh, damage mechanisms are shown in blue, matrix fracture in green, fiber matrix debonding, fiber pullout in, in, in orange, and in red, fiber fracture. At the bottom, we show you just uh, uh, the, the, the uh, damage mechanisms without matrix factors. And here you can see um, when we have 90 degrees um, uh, orientation, the fiber matrix debonding is the dominating uh, damage mechanism. The AS, uh, the fiber pullout is dominating at zero degrees. And when you change the material, you can investigate what is happening uh, uh, and uh, what are the main damage mechanisms. You can do, do also a strain analysis um, together uh, uh, with the uh, defect characterization. Um, so the in situ investigations are done in a way that you uh, evaluate the defects and that you do also uh, digital volume correlation. Digital volume correlation leads to a strain analysis and then you can um, see uh, whether there's a correspondence of the defects with the final uh, fracture uh, and with the strain. So this is a very big topic and, um, uh, and we're doing a lot of investigations in this field, investigating the defects, investigating the strain and in investigating also uh, where's the final fracture. Now we'll come uh, to the uh, next point, uh, phase contrast and dark field methods. Um, these methods have together that you can measure not only the absorption contrast, you can measure also the differential phase contrast and the dark field contrast. So you can measure the absorption, you can measure refraction, and you can measure scattering. And uh, what, 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 uh, when you measure these three different physical values, um, how does uh, this correspond to the, um, uh, to the structure or the, the, to the material what you're investigating? So here uh, we have investigated uh, already that mole. So here we see the bone uh, structure in absorption. In the phase contrast picture, we see the lung and the bone. And uh, in the dark um, field contrast, we see scattering. So scattering means if there's um, pores and cracks, then we see the scattering. So with, with each modality, we see different things. With absorption, we see the bone. With the phase contrast, we see the bone and the, uh, the lung. And with uh, scattering, we see the microscopic structure. Uh, here, we investigated uh, a polymeric tube. And inside the polymeric tube, there are some uh, uh, polymeric foam granules. And we see with, uh, the, with absorption, we see the, the, the tube mainly. And uh, with the dark field image, with the scattering, we see the, 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 the foam quite nicely. And, uh, yeah, and for applications uh, where you want to see the, the scattering, the, the foam structure uh, better, uh, this is a, a better application. And here, um, another example, it's the impact. The impact um, uh, with a uh, seven uh, joule impact. In blue, we see the absorption signal. In red, we see the dark field signal. And you see different things. So this is a carbon fiber reinforced polymer example. So the, the impact comes from the top and the most damage is on the other side. Uh, and you will see the different, um, yeah, Damage uh, in blue, the absorption damage uh, measured by absorption contrast, and in red, measured by dark field contrast. We can do also a 3D evaluation, a 3D evaluation uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, for example, here, the carbon, carbon, carbon fiber reinforced polymer example. So, here in this case, uh, we have a complex uh, 3D structure. The carbon fibers, uh, they don't, they have a similar absorption contrast, they have a similar density than the polymer. Therefore, in the absorption picture, there's not a good contrast between, um, between the carbon fibers, carbon fiber bundles, and the resin. This can see here on the left, can be seen on the left side. Here, we have uh, the dark field contrast uh, picture, and we see the uh, carbon fiber reinforced bundles quite nicely. 
and uh, by measuring uh, the uh, at different orientations the uh, orientation of the fiber bundles we can get a 3d a 3d structure of the carbon free reinforced uh, fiber bundles so here in um, a, a 2d slice is shown and uh, on the other side there are also some um, regions in the sample where there are no fibers no carbon fibers and this can be much better measured by differential phase contrast by refraction contrast and this is shown here on the uh, on the uh, right button here in red these are the resin rich areas the resin rich areas they have no fibers no carbon fibers inside so here there's just a carb uh, the, the resin the polymer so we can measure with the differential phase contrast the resin rich areas and with the dark field contrast we can measure the orientation of the carbon fibers in 3d so the two modalities give an um, give interesting and important information well i will come to the last point uh, this is immersive analytics of ct data uh, this is a rather new research field uh, so immersive analytics means uh, it's something between augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, and reality itself. We have a material system, or we have a part, we have an imaging technique, uh, in this our case it's CT, and then we get 3D data or 4D data, and then we have uh, the 3D data. We can do visual analytics with this um, 3D data. We can uh, do mixed reality um, uh, visualizations, this is then called immersive analytics. And when we do uh, some collaboration with, it, with this uh, data, with this visualized data, it's called collaborative analytics. And so once again, here we have the primary data. With the primary CT data, we can do some segmentation and classification. Then we get the fiber orientation, we get uh, uh, porosity, feature two, feature three, and so on. And this 3D data together with the secondary data can be um, visualized uh, in different ways. So here we have a conventional um, desktop visualization of the CT data together with the, um, with the processed data, with the data what we have got from the CT data. In B, uh, we visualize uh, the data together uh, with with reality, so uh, here we have a mock-up of, of an augmented reality system. So here we have uh, a train, and we have uh, some uh, measurement data, and uh, the measurement data are visualized um, together with reality uh, augmented reality system. And in C, we have just a three D visualization of the CT data. Uh, this is a, a virtual reality-based system, so they, uh, uh, the man here can look with this uh, goggles into the CT data in 3D. And the last thing is what we are uh, developing right now is a co collaborative system. So we have here a desktop system, a big, big desktop, um, and we have also a VR system, and they the two people are collaborating. Uh, one can look at the VR data and one can be look at the desktop data. And so collaboration and discussion is possible. And with this um, uh, CT uh, uh, data, you can do really a lot. And uh, 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 we are right, right now developing such a, a prototype uh, where you can collaborate uh, on the basis of the CT data systems. So I'm almost at the end uh, of my talk. Uh, so I see at the screen 30 minutes. I have just um, two slides uh, left. One is the a summary, a very, very short summary. So I have shown you several new developments and um, there are a lot of trends uh, in the CT field because you can do a lot with the CT data and uh, uh, CT is still a growing technology. So a lot of new companies are trying to use CT, X-ray CT, and there are still a lot of new applications of CT which are not yet identified.
and the new developments what I have shown to you. So quantitative CT, um, quantitative CT, uh, high resolution CT, in situ CT, so the, the investigation of a process by CT, phase contrast methods, where you can measure not only absorption, but also refraction and scattering and immersive analytics uh, methods in connection together with CT data that give uh, an, an additional uh, trends and additional force to new applications. So here's a, a picture of the CT cube. When, whenever you are interested, um, please uh, contact me or the people from the CT group. Uh, when you have uh, new applications, um, just uh, uh, send us an email. Uh, we can show, we can see what, you, uh, what we can do. Uh, we are especially interested uh, for really uh, new applications, uh, for applications which are not easy. So hard tasks uh, are nice for us. And uh, yeah, please, whenever you have uh, the wish uh, to, uh, to do a CT measurement, uh, we can do it for you. Um, we do it uh, off, very often also for free because uh, when we don't know whether the results uh, uh, are nice or not uh, nice, because sometimes it's very difficult to say in advance whether this is possible or not possible, uh, we do uh, a CT measurement and see what we get. And then and when we have nice results, uh, uh, we do further measurements. Okay, 